Good evening, everyone. My name is Morgan Sorkson, and I have the heavy task of talking to you about what gun violence can do to an adolescence, particularly here in Green Bay. So, first, um, gun violence has become a national conversation. We first see this in the media. It's become a widespread phenomenon in America, highlighted in news stories to the point of glorification. Mass shootings are becoming everyday happenings, particularly school shootings. In 2019 alone, there have been over 40 mass shootings so far. Nationally, there are about 11.8 deaths per year per 100,000 citizens. For Green Bay, there's been an average of three deaths per year over the last six years for Green Bay alone. So what does this mean for adolescents? First off, we must look at what community violence does to the adolescent brain. Research has shown that gun violence impacts adolescents' brains in significant ways. We know that different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions. And here is how violence impacts these different parts of the brain. In a 2018 study, researchers looked at hippocampal and amygdala sizes of youth exposed to community violence just four years before. After all, these regions of the brain are important control centers for emotions, memory, and motivation. They found that youth exposed to community violence had significantly smaller left and right hippocampal and amygdala volumes, controlling for age, gender, and concurrent community violence exposure. This study also concluded that those exposed to community violence showed greater resting state connectivity between the right hippocampus and the bilateral frontal temporal regions of the brain. This means that adolescents exposed to community violence will likely struggle with their emotions as well as their performance in school because of memory and other learning issues. These brain changes are likely to account for the large emotional impacts community violence has. There have been years of research looking into how violence can impact youth and adolescents. For gun violence in particular, this means that there have been findings that those exposed to gun violence in their youth more likely to be depressed, show symptoms of complicated grief and PTSD, along with externalizing problems. In the long run, adolescents have shown to increase their substance abuse when compared to youth not exposed to gun violence. Obviously, all these components lead to school problems. Now, what do adolescents actually think about gun carrying? In a 2015 study of over 1,200 adolescents, the researchers looked at the perceptions of gun carrying. Shockingly, 47% of participants had carried a gun in their lifetime. Those who carried a gun perceived it less of a risk when carrying that gun, along with lower certainty of punishment. Those who carried a firearm also perceived the social and personal rewards to be higher than when they did not carry a gun. However, evidence actually shows that those who carry a gun are more likely to be exposed to violence. When participants stopped carrying a gun, they saw less personal and social rewards from carrying. Most importantly, there was a decrease in violence exposure after gun carrying ceased. So you just learned about how adolescent brains, behaviors, emotions, and perceptions change when exposed to community violence. These studies were done outside of Green Bay, some cities larger than our own, but some quite similar to Green Bay. My title is Triggered, The Impact of Gun Violence on Adolescents, a Green Bay Lesson. So what can we learn from our own community about gun violence? I had the pleasure of working as an intern with the Green Bay Police Department in their Crime Analyst Division in the fall of 2018. I read through cases that involved a firearm of any kind and sifted through countless cases involving adolescents. I did this by reading narratives, statements, and evidence, and then color coordinating all of that into some kind of spreadsheet that showed all the results. So I looked at the number of shots fired, the number of weapons, the number of victims and offenders. I then coded those cases into location, either open or enclosed. An open location would be somewhere out in public, such as a park. An enclosed location would be in a vehicle or in a household. 
I then looked at the motivation, which can I say is the hardest because some of these cases didn't have a motivation or nothing was clear. But some examples would be robbery, love, or it was just an accident. Finally, we come to the results, which are the most important. Did someone die? Was someone injured? Was there property damage? Or were there no shots fired at all? Here is a map of all the homicides, suicides, and injuries in Green Bay from 2013 until the end of my internship in December. Those dots represent about 50 lives that have been physically changed because of gun violence. Those pings are just the cases that someone was physically shot. That does not include the number of drive-by shootings with no victims, threats with a gun, or violence with a gun present. 39 cases since 2013 had shots fired with no injuries, and 49 cases had property damage in that same time period. In 2017, there was a peak of 19 property damage cases. Now, this is just the number of cases, not the number of shots actually fired. Sadly, as I read through more than 500 cases that involved guns in the past six years in Green Bay alone, these cases were not isolated to adults. Children not even old enough to talk were present in the same room as a gun. Youth barely old enough to be considered teens played with BB guns. What happens when those guns become real guns? Right now, there are teens in our community who possess guns, and boy, do they use them. So what can we do? In a country where only one-third of gun-owning families reported safe firearm, firearm storage, what can we do as a community to help? From research in other cities, it has been found that locating hotspots helps cut down on crime. This is where police target certain areas with more police activity and community outreach. The Green Bay Police Department crime analysts already do this and point out hotspots in a weekly crime control newsletter that alerts officers and staff to possible areas and people of concern. This community outreach I mentioned is where police officers and city officials make a conscious and noticeable effort to educate family and youth about guns and promote safety. As a community, we can embrace any attempts made by city officials and go to these educational programs. Green Bay does this with community policing officers who are a resource to various parts of the city. They also show a positive face to the police force, so it's not always negative. To further this point, we as a community can take on the task of educating ourselves. Educating health and mental health officials is key, especially when they can assess youth alone from the parents. They take time and have a scheduled basis on when they can interact with these youth away from parental figures. We all remember what it's like to be a middle schooler, a teen, or a young adult. Some of you, that's a more recent memory than others, but imagine the impacts of gun violence and what that would have on your own childhood. Imagine how the exposure of such violence would have made you feel and how it would have impacted your education and interaction with your family. Fathom how your brain would have altered, literally changed, because of such violence. Sadly, many adolescents don't have to imagine. Now, I'm not trying to leave you all dreary on this lovely springy Wednesday night, but please remember to support the youth in our community. The largest thing is support. Support, support, support. Support community officials. Support officers. Support parents. Support teachers. But most importantly, support struggling teens. You do not have to be anyone special to hold out a welcoming hand to a struggling youth. Thank you.